This is a Keystone Howard Series 5 pocket watch sent to me by a viewer. It's a long forgotten family heirloom that has since been found buried in a drawer. I am absolutely thrilled that I decided to film this one as you're about to witness one of the most challenging and fun repairs as of late. It looks bad on the surface, no crystal, the hands are ripped off, and there's obvious signs of rust and water damage. But that's only the tip of the iceberg. This watch has a lot more in store for me as you'll soon find out. So stick with me to the end and join me as I uncover all the secrets this timepiece has to tell. Now before I start taking any watch apart, I try to test basic functions like winding, time setting, and timekeeping performance if it were running. For this watch, it won't wind at all, so I assume it's fully wound. And the setting mode is completely jammed. I assume this has something to do with all this rust. This is a swing out case. Aside from some scuffs and scratches, it's in remarkable condition. I have a real soft spot for Howard movements. They have such a beautiful and artistic design. The company has a rather complex history, but more on that later. It's fitting that the movement is in a Keystone case, as that is actually the company that owned the Howard brand at the time this movement was produced. The two case screws are removed so the movement can be uninstalled from the case. There are three dial foot screws securing the dial to the movement. Dial feet are little metal rods soldered to the underside of the dial and protrude into the movement. Ooh, I don't know if this movement has ever seen a service. Look at all that oil. Might as well be glue. Time setting appears to be jammed up at the hour wheel and cannon pinion in the center. It's taking significant effort to convince this hour wheel off the cannon pinion. Normally the hour wheel just sits loosely over it. That cannon pinion isn't going anywhere. The presto puller can usually make quick work of them, but this one isn't having any of it. Time for some liquid magic. If you've never heard of Croil, I highly recommend you keep some of this on hand. I'll place a few drops over the pinion and try again later. What we have here is a broken balance staff. Whenever any mechanical watch experiences a traumatic shock, one or both of the balance pivots may break as they're the most delicate pivots within the movement. What's going on with this pallet bridge? Did someone actually glue the jewel into it? Seems like it may be shellac, and it appears to be missing one of its screws. Okay, before going any further, I'll go ahead and let down the power of the mainspring. Here's the click which rests against the ratchet wheel on top of the mainspring barrel. I'll need to hold this click away from the ratchet wheel while gently easing down the power of the spring. You really want to do this before disassembling any movement. As soon as the pallet fork is removed, there would be nothing holding back the power. Any uncontrolled surge of power will surely damage something within the train. The pallet cock and pallet fork are now removed. The train wheel cock is removed.
The center bridge is now uninstalled. I'll now work on the barrel bridge starting with these three screws. The crown wheel is now removed. The crown wheel seat is stuck to it thanks to the old oils. This is what's called a jeweled safety barrel. The jewel setting is first removed from the ratchet wheel and then the ratchet wheel can be separated from the barrel. Once that is done, the barrel bridge can be lifted away. The internal winding stem assembly is now removed. The mainspring barrel is slid out and away. The third wheel, fourth wheel, and escape wheel are removed. This movement is going to need a lot of pre-cleaning before it goes into the machine. Onto the dial side, first the intermediate setting gear is removed. The yoke is now removed. The setting lever is lifted away. The yoke spring is also uninstalled for cleaning. Hmm, still nothing. The lower balance hole jewel is capped. I will remove it from the movement so that the cap jewel can be separated from the hole jewel for more effective cleaning. As you can see, the cap jewel and hole jewel are filthy, but fortunately intact. The balance wheel is removed from the balance cock by loosening the set screw that secures the hairspring stud. The upper pivot is broken off of the balance staff. The lower pivot seems fine, but the entire staff will still need to be replaced. It's also a good habit to ensure all the timing screws are present on the rim of the balance wheel. As with the lower jewels, the upper balance hole and cap jewels are removed and separated for cleaning. The cap jewel looks filthy. As for the hole jewel, well, that's usually what happens to these when the balance breaks. I'll have to find a replacement. As mentioned before, this is a safety barrel and has several advantages over the typical going barrel. With a going barrel, the ratchet wheel is attached to the top of the arbor. So when the movement is wound, the internal arbor rotates as the barrel remains stationary. As power runs down, the arbor remains stationary as the entire barrel rotates. The toothed barrel, where the mainspring is coiled, directly drives the train. Since there is no safety mechanism built into the traditional going barrel, a fault can be catastrophic. So higher grade movements are designed with a safety pinion or patent pinion 
on the second wheel. A sudden and unexpected release of power activates this pinion, which is then automatically unscrewed to absorb the shock to the train, leaving the parts unharmed. With a safety barrel, however, this type of safety mechanism is built directly into the arbor. When winding, the upper spring barrel rotates while the arbor remains stationary. When running, the toothed lid of the barrel with the arbor attached rotates while the remainder of the barrel remains stationary. The mainspring is coiled within the portion of the barrel on which the ratchet wheel is directly attached. So if the mainspring were to break, the surge of power is released into the barrel itself and through the ratchet mechanism, meaning the train of wheels doesn't experience any of the trauma. Okay, so the presto puller may not have been as strong as I thought, but I was successful in using a pin vise to pull the cannon pinion off the center wheel arbor. The corrosion is extensive and all this rust is going to need to be removed in order to restore proper function to this movement. For this, I've had a lot of success using a product called Evaporust. Simply soak the affected parts and the rust will be dissolved. From there, I'll evaluate the integrity of what remains. Onto the pallet. The jewel here has a crack in it. It doesn't extend to the hole, so I doubt it's really hurting anything, but combined with the fact that someone had to glue in the jewel, makes me just want to replace it properly with a new one. I'm pretty sure shellac was used as the adhesive, and isopropyl alcohol is an excellent solvent for it. The next morning. With most of the adhesive removed, I'll proceed with using the sights tool to press out the existing jewel. This pusher is equipped with a spring-loaded center. I want the new jewel to sit just as high in the hole as this one, so first I'm measuring the depth and securing it with the help of the micrometer dial at the top. This will be used as the stop or reference point when pressing in the new one. Next, I'll use the pump handle to press out the jewel into the stump. The jewel dropped into this little part of the tool. Oops. It's seen better days. I will need to order a replacement. Meanwhile, I'll make some more progress with the disassembly and cleaning of the rest of the movement. Gross. All jeweled holes are scrubbed using pegwood dipped in naphtha. This is particularly helpful in loosening and eliminating the dried up oil stuck to the surfaces. Naphtha and a nylon brush are used to pre-clean the plates and other components. Nylon does not scratch the surfaces of the parts, but is firm enough to scrub away the grime.
I also inspect all the parts more closely during this time, which is when I discover this big old chip in the center wheel jewel. I'm just not sure if the damage occurred with whatever trauma broke the balance, or with all the manipulations I applied when trying to remove the cannon pinion. This one is rubbed into a setting, so the entire setting and jewel is punched out using the staking set, and I plan to order a replacement. I'll now create a new screw to replace the one that was missing from the pallet cock. The head and length will match the other screw and I'll use the screw plate to create the threads. I start with preparing the rod and then begin with turning down the shank to size. The shank is then turned into the screw plate to create the threads. I use the lathe tailstock to help square it off against the work. I left the shank a bit long and will now need to shorten it to the correct length. I then separated the shank from the rod, leaving enough to form the head. The rod happens to be the same width I need for the head, so all that is left to do is cut the slot. The steel now needs to be tempered to a blue color to increase the toughness of the screw. I'll later polish the blue oxide layer off the head so that it matches the other screw. You'll notice I used a Swiss thread plate to create the screw. Access to American thread plates are nearly impossible, but as a result, I need to tap the hole with the new threads to match the new screw. That'll do. I just received the replacement balance staff, so I'll tackle that now. First, I carefully lever the hairspring off the top of the staff. Since I'm dealing with a double roller balance, I'll use my trusty Rex Roller Removal Tool. Yes, the Angry Beaver Teeth Tool. It does a nice job of securing the roller at the base of the staff so that the balance can safely be punched free of the roller. I'm using the K&D number 50 staff remover helper, which clamps the arms of the balance while the staff is punched out. 
Since the staff is riveted to the arm, the arm needs to be secured during the punching process or the arm will fold up as the staff is pressed down. I'll add that this will be the last time you'll see me punch out a staff in this way, as I've been practicing using a lathe to turn the hub off the staff so that the wheel can be slid off the bottom, which is an even safer approach. The replacement staff appears to have a different hub shape, but all the other dimensions are correct. The new staff is placed in the staking anvil, and I lower the balance wheel over top to prepare it for riveting. I will now use a domed face punch to expand the riveting shoulder of the staff. When I'm satisfied with the strength of the rivet, I will finish it off by flattening any remaining lip with a flat face punch so that the hairspring collet sits as flush to the balance as possible. The roller table is lowered into place before it is secured with the help of a special punch that has a slot for the jewel. Finally, the safety roller is fitted, ensuring the opening to receive the pallet fork horn is directly above the impulse jewel on the roller. A basic static poise check reveals a fair deal of oscillation. A balance that is not in poise causes positional variations in timekeeping. When it comes to poising, decisions need to be made whether to remove weight from the heavier side or add weight to the lighter side. An overall reduction of weight speeds up the timekeeping, and an inverse is true for adding weight. For that decision, I look at the state of the meantime screws that can be used to compensate for this. Based on how far they're screwed in, I'm choosing to remove weight from the heavier side, and then I will turn them out more as needed to compensate for the overall lighter weight of the balance. There are several ways to remove material from timing screws. My favorite approach is to discreetly shave material off the underside of the screw with the help of this balance screw undercutter tool. It's an iterative process. I don't want to remove too much material, or I'll be creating more work for myself as I'll then need to add timing washers to make up the difference. So I typically check the poise three or four times until I'm happy with things. This approach to undercutting the screw is nicer than the quick and dirty alternative of just shaving material off a corner. While there is no functional difference, the alternative is not as visually appealing. When poised, the balance should coast nicely to a stop with no major oscillations. The hairspring is reinstalled, and for the orientation, I'll use this reference point marked on the rim of the wheel that indicates the approximate position of the stud. Again, this is just an approximation and is a great starting point to use when trying to dial in that beat error. Before placing an order for the replacement pallet hole jewel, I will first need to determine the outer and inner diameter. Since the existing jewel was loose enough such that it had to be glued in, I will order a jewel the next size up and then ream the hole for a nice tight fit. The inner diameter will need to be between 0.01 to 0.02 millimeters larger than the pivot of the pallet fork arbor. The replacement jewel has arrived, and after verifying the sizes of the outer and inner dimensions, I'll use my sights tool to install it. All the reamers are designed to be one thousandth of a millimeter smaller than the common jewel sizes for the best friction fit. The diameter of the replacement jewel is 2 mm, so I'll choose the 0.199 mm reamer for the hole. The pusher is removed and the reamer handle is inserted into the tool. A little oil helps lubricate the cutting process. The correct size is achieved when the entire lower part of the reamer shank can fit into the hole.
Recall I preset the depth of the jewel on the micrometer dial. I'm choosing a self-centering pusher that is just smaller than the hole. The spring-loaded center finds the jewel hole and I can then continue to press until the top of the pusher bottoms out on the micrometer knob. The jewel is now secured within the hole, no glue required. Now I need to validate end shake and freedom of movement with the pallet fork. Good end shake and freedom of movement. As for the center wheel, I couldn't find a replacement rubbed in style jewel for the setting. Instead, I decided to take a similar friction style approach. However, even then my options were limited. In the end, I was able to source a 2.6 millimeter wide center wheel jewel with the right inner diameter for the arbor. The same process is now repeated for reaming and friction fitting the replacement jewel. There isn't as precise a depth consideration here as the center jewels are typically just flushed with the train side of the plate. Therefore, I'm choosing a flat pusher that's larger than the jewel so that I can ensure it is pressed even with the plate. As a matter of personal preference, I'll use the micrometer dial instead of the swing handle to gradually press in the jewel. I feel I have more control this way. The center wheel can now be tested in the new jewel. Good end shake and freedom of movement. These enamel pocket watch dials can be safely cleaned by soaking overnight in a mixture of water and denture cleaner. Give it a try sometime, you'll be amazed by the results.
This movement will receive a fresh white alloy mainspring. It's simply pressed into the barrel, being mindful of the hook at the end of the tail. The spring is lightly lubricated with Mobius D5. The safety barrel is now fitted back together. The lower balance jewels are now reinstalled. The replacement for the upper balance jewel, well, doesn't quite fit. No worries, I already have the lathe set up from earlier. I do own a set of jeweling chucks, but this jewel is already wafer thin, so I'll take a slightly different approach. I'm going to use a tiny scrap rod as a type of wax chuck, and super glue the setting to the end of it. The tailstock helps center the jewel as the glue cures. I only need to reduce the size by a small amount until it fits snugly in the hole. The jewel is soaked in acetone to dissolve the glue when I'm done. The cap jewel is also reinstalled. These jewels will be oiled a bit later using an automatic oiler. The yoke spring is now fitted to the movement. The intermediate setting gear post is lubricated with D5 before it is reinstalled. The yoke is fitted to the plate. Mollycoat DX grease is used on the sliding metal to metal surfaces. I'm using some Rotico to clean off the excess. And now the setting lever can be reinstalled. Mobius 9010 is injected through the whole jewel using a Bergen 1A automatic oiler. The balance wheel can be reinstalled by securing the hairspring stud using the set screw. The lower balance hole jewel is oiled with 9010 as well. It's always worthwhile to test the balance by itself. Doing so helps rule out potential root causes if something isn't working right on the fully assembled movement. I'm also ensuring the impulse jewel is centered between the banking pins when viewed with the line of sight down the center of the escape wheel and pallet fork jewels. Doing so minimizes the beat error, which could be corrected by slightly rotating the hairspring collet in either direction. The internal winding stem components are lubricated before they're assembled. D5 
lubricates the jeweled barrel hole before the mainspring barrel is lowered onto the plate with a stowaway piece of hair. The escape wheel, fourth wheel, and third wheel are reinstalled. Thank goodness I noticed that hair. The second wheel is lowered into position. The barrel bridge is now installed. The center wheel bridge is now fitted. The train wheel cock is now installed, ensuring that both pivots are seated before tightening it down. The ratchet wheel is now fixed to the mainspring barrel. The arbor jewel in setting is lowered back into place. I did happen to have a replacement for that mismatched screw on hand. The crown wheel and crown wheel seat are installed with the sliding surfaces oiled with Mobius D5. Both pallet jewels are greased with Mobius 941. These slide against the faces of the escape wheel teeth and do benefit from this lubrication. The pallet cock is now reinstalled. All train wheel pivots are oiled with Mobius 9010. The watch is wound up as I prepare for the step I look forward to the most, the installation of the balance. I love this part as I know it's likely the first time this watch has run in perhaps a hundred years. The owner of this watch would like the case polished. I'm going to shine it up a bit without going too overboard knowing that this is a gold filled case after all.
the deeper scratches and imperfections still remain, but I felt the result was a good balance between preservation and aesthetic. The corrosion on the hour wheel is further remediated with the help of some peg wood and cerium oxide paste. It looks much better now, and will still function as originally intended. With the cannon pinion, minute wheel, and hour wheel installed, I lay on the dial washer in preparation for the installation of the dial, which has been taking a nice relaxing bath and denture cleaner. The dial foot screws are tightened to secure the dial to the movement. The E. Howard Clock Company was originally founded by Edward Howard in 1842. After some success in creating monumental clocks for shops, banks, and offices, he co-founded a watchmaking company in 1850. Howard leveraged economies of scale by new levels of precision and interchangeability of parts he saw initially within the factories in Roxbury, on the south side of Boston, Massachusetts. He was seen as a visionary in producing timepieces at scale. Though his businesses didn't stand on their own for very long, they're part of the heritage of the American Watch Company, which soon became Waltham. Eventually, the brand was purchased by the Keystone Watch Case Company in 1903. The watch in this video was produced in 1907. So, the watch in this video and its contemporaries are known as Keystone Howards. Howard branded movements, regardless of parent company, were of exceptional quality and formidable finishing. The time grapher results look pretty good, and I hope Joel is satisfied with the end result. This was a fun project, and I'm glad I got to share some different repair techniques with you, so I hope you learned something from this video today, but if not, I hope you at least found it enjoyable. Thanks for fixing watches with me today, and I'll see you in the next one.